Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Welcome. We have an extremely special guest. You just did a cameo, cameo over there. We have Michelle Zukowski. She was the uh, first chair clarinetist of the Los Angeles Philharmonic for 54 years. And we're just so excited. We have so many questions for her. So, Michelle, please join us. Make a grand entrance. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do for an encore? I can't wait. <laughs> That's great. Welcome, Michelle. This is going to be so much fun and so educational. Hey, Andy, Andy, what are you doing in my room? <laughs> <laughs> it's called the new normal. <laughs> I know. Okay. Well, I actually, uh, Michelle's father, Calvin Block, was also in the uh, orchestra. I just want to ask you. How many years before you joined was he in the orchestra? And how many years were, were you in the orchestra together in the same section? Okay, that's that's easy. Um, Kalman Block, my father, got in in 1937. Klemper got him in because they played together. Actually, he accompanied my dad. And he said, oh, I, I like the way you play. I think there was one other contestant. Ah, oh, you're hired. So anyway, in 1937, he got in and then... I got in in 1961, uh, 47, 57, uh, yeah, 28 years or something. And so, yeah, so he had a good life. And then I showed up for kind of tough. But that's and, and when did he leave the orchestra? What year? 81. So 81. we had 20, yeah, we had 20 years to torture. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Now, before we do anything, we, we, we have our usual diehards. We've got uh, John Yeh's already here cheering everyone on and Michael Drapkin and Lorenzo and David Blumberg and everyone. But before we do anything, we need to introduce a very special people. This is Lorenzo, of course. He's our techie genius. Hey. And um, and he's so dedicated. I want everyone to know it's uh, the, the Michelle is up much earlier than she wanted to be, and we're up much later. It's midnight I, I, here. Nine o'clock during the time of COVID, nine o'clock in the morning. That's tough, man. That's right. And she promised me pajamas, Eight but I don't know why you ruined it. Yeah. And we, <laughs> it's <laughs> what I want, and we need to introduce our buddy Ednaldo over there, who's our techie this consultant. Ednaldo. Hello. Thomas, and he's a wonderful Hello. clarinet Hello. player and a techie and brilliant. <laughs> And yes, Brazilian. Now, and Brazilian. Awesome. So I wanted to say everyone's been so cooperative on this. It's really a community project. It's not. It's not just ours. And Ednaldo actually contacted me. He's from Brazil, and he's been watching all these. And he said, "I really want to translate and write Portuguese subtitles." And then he put me in. He also, you know, he said he was a student of Michelle's, and and we discussed it. And and here we are. And uh, Lorenzo, of course, is a is is a bass clarinetist with the Hong Kong Phil, and really, I mean, the whole thing is probably his idea, and, and he's been helping us. So I want to say how special today is, because today is his birthday. He just hit uh, 35 years old. He's now closer to 40 than 30. Yeah. I'm in my pajama. He's in a, and, um, you know, he lives an hour away, and he, because it's midnight here, he's taking out a hotel room with his family, so he doesn't have to travel at the at the end of this, and so he's really dedicated to this um project and and we we really thank him uh thank for you. that thank and, you lorenzo yes and one more thing today is the sadly the anniversary of benny goodman's death okay so lorenzo was one years old exactly when um when betty goodman died okay what so year was, what year was that do you know um well, well 86 86 yeah uh, yeah so, so anyway, so let's just go right there. Did you ever meet Benny Goodman? He was at our house because my father was a he was a great teacher, and so Benny took from Leon Rushinoff. He I think he took from a lot of people. I even have a photo of Benny and Dad and me. I should have I should get it out. I might at the very end. Yeah, so we knew him really well. Wow. In fact, I looked it up. Your dad and he were within two years of each other's age. So, you know, very much the same generation. And Absolutely. so, yeah, phenomenal. And ju just as a clarinet player and someone who had it, had him over and someone who was kind of a fellow student of your father's like you, what, what 
what did Betty Goodman mean to you? I mean, or or well, everything. I, I'm like you. He, I'm a complete fan. I mean, I got all his records. I got his original, the original Bartok contrast. If it hadn't been for Benny Goodman, we would not have half the modern repertoire we have today. He is like our our man of the 20th century. Hold on a minute. Just for, I want to show you the photo. Just wait a second. Please, sure. Facebook. Hi guys, look, so things might be not running exactly uh, perfectly, but this is really a historical um, uh, moment in my mind, interviewing Michelle and, and all the others. So um, let her get her photo. I mean, this is, you know, this is all history. Calvin Block, Benny Goodman, Michelle Zukowski. The man. Uh, uh, Jim, my husband's looking around for it. He's okay, saying, good. He's being very useful today. That's yeah. great. Um, fantastic. Great. So what, I couldn't even know where to start. So I, I, I have this very weird timeline. We're just going to talk kind of post-retirement and a few loose ends. And then we're going to go right from the beginning and work our way through. So just bear with me, right? So what I'd like to do is... Um, oh, this oh, is my... Here we go. Fantastic. My husband was last time. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Here it that? is. You want that also? Um, yeah, sure. What's the date? Yeah. Thank you, Dad. Yeah. What is it? Okay. This is uh, uh no more. Okay, you gotta move it a little bit. Okay. Oh brilliant. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's Dad. Wow. That's wow. Benny. And that's me, even different looking <laughs> in nineteen seventy six. Wow. I was yeah, I was about to do the uh, Copeland Concerto, and I wanted him to coach me a little. He played it with the L.A. Philharmonic, Benny did. That's a great photo. Thank you so much, Michelle. Okay, I don't have to hold it anymore? Okay. No, no, you feel free to it <laughs> if you're getting tired. Um, um, and so I actually wanted to ask you, I mean, on YouTube, I've seen his performance of the L.A. Phil and Copeland conducting. Did you actually have a chance to do that yourself? Did you ever, well, did you ever work with Aaron Copeland as a conductor? Yeah, yeah. yeah he he conducted me and I did the concerto tell in 19... Brahms. What? what? Tell him about Brahms. He's saying, tell him about Brahms. He's dead meat later. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> no, I never worked with Brahms. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I did, the, I did the... You know, that's a funny looking thing. Do you see that right here? Mm -hmm. What is that? It's the, the internet. Oh, it's the internet's making... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, I'm not kidding. Okay, so anyway, I worked with uh, um, Copeland, did the clarinet concerto with him. So he was conducting, and I was trying to play it at the Hollywood Bowl. At the Hollywood Bowl. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, we're gonna we're gonna get into all these great these great things in a minute. So you've been retired about five years, is that right? Four and a half. Four, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to exaggerate. Three wait, wait. weeks. Two weeks. Five hours and 27 seconds. <laughs> but, but who's counting, right? <laughs> so okay. so how, how's retirement? What have you been doing for the last four and a half years? Well, after I got out of the fetal position of... Ah, you know, <laughs> that, that, that happens, you know? It's like, ah, I don't go to work and there's another guy sitting in my chair, you know? It's kind of, <laughs> but um, I'm okay now. <laughs> I'm okay, really. <laughs> I I teach and play chamber music and I kind of after a while it was kind of fun not having to wake up at seven in the morning, you know. And until I called you to do this show, right? It's <laughs> Andrew Simon, you know. So it's like, so it's okay, it's okay. I'm I'm good with it now. But I'm I'm so, I was so old when I retired actually, so I'm really old now. I mean, it's just. The hardest thing of retirement, hardest thing of playing in that orchestra is just getting up into the chairs because it was hard to get up there. It's like I didn't want to fall down. <laughs> it was very, very precipitous. But that was the hardest part of playing in the orchestra at the end. Wow. The other part, the other part was uh, what was the other part? It's getting a little uh, tired of just sort of sitting around and counting rests and stuff like that. But it was not hard to play the clarinet. I don't know why. Crazy. Wow! Yeah, <laughs> that was, that, that's great. Um, I now I, I mean, 
he played there for 54 years. Now you're talking about the fetal position. Um, what? How does one after 54 years of, of, of you know, playing top class clarinet and, and you know all the the big venues and everything? How, what? How do you say one day, okay, that's it, I'm done? How do you, you get to that? Why did I decide to retire? Yes. Or it yes. was. It's a long story because I was looking to just go out and have a good time before I retired. And so my mind was already somewhere else. And then I met Jim and it was a good, easy transition actually to, you know, just kind of hanging out and change my life. Moved out of Hollywood and live in Altadena in a nice big house. And it's a whole different life. It's okay. New husband, new house, new, I mean, it's okay. I like it. I, I had, it was good to leave the house that I, you know, kind of had my career in from, the, from 1976 from to 19, well, to 2012 or 14. And I got married a couple of years ago and that was that. Like I'm starting my life over. Well, wow. great. Can I teach? Yeah. Um, what was it? Did you have, did they have some send off for you? Was there a, a final concert? I was so happy to see me leave that they had. <laughs> oh my God. A standing ovation. And then the Deborah Border wrote a haiku poetry in English. It said, I don't know, it was like words, but the subliminal message must have been thank God, don't let the door hit you on the butt on the way out. But <laughs> the was, you know, Light streaming through whatever, and then uh, they just all the conductors, you know, said little things about me. I mean, really, of course, I was there before some of those conductors were, conductors were even alive to be. <laughs> yeah, so it was wonderful. It was good. They made a big deal. Wow, well, well deserved. Well deserved. Um, now. I, I have little hints of uh, little tidbits to go before we start getting more organized. Um, two legendary clarinetists in your past gave you some bits of advice, right? Harold Wright and Simeon Bellison, isn't that right? Actually, it was Harold Wright, and I don't know who called who first. I think he called me and he says, Michelle, should I retire? And so I said, no, just don't. You know, just even if you have to die in the bathroom at the Philharmonic, just stay there. So he took my advice and then I asked his advice and he said, I said, what's your advice about sounding good? He says, always use a good read. Always use yeah. a good read. That's it. And I mean, he, I never took lessons from him. I actually never took lessons from anybody except four lessons with Leon, but the great teacher, of course, was my father. I didn't realize it at the time, you know. It's like somebody leaves his wife, you know, and she's she's nice and everything, but you know, he wants something new. He, I had no idea what a great teacher my father was until I tried the other teachers, and they were just <laughs> nothing. Nothing happened. It was like wow. incredible. Um, yeah, and did Simeon Bellison also give you some advice, or or was it passed no, on through your dad? Or I did no. I was five when I saw him, but I mean, I gave a whole lecture on what it was like to meet him and everything. And uh, this lovely man with a, a watch, you know, one of those watch things that I dipped into his tea by mistake. And he was, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I remember that. And he was just, and it was like visiting my grandfather. My grandfather was in New York too, and they looked alike, <laughs> Russian guys. And so sometimes I'd mix them up. Hi, Grandpa. Oh, no, that's Simeon Bellison. Anyway, Bellison was the teacher of my father. And he had his special way of teaching. And my father also had his special way of teaching. And you'll probably ask me later on how they taught. I gave a lecture in 2016. Uh, I was in Kansas during the ICA of the convention. And they wanted me to give it. It was a funny lecture about how my father taught. How my, and I could run that by you again if nobody saw it so yeah well you we will we'll, we'll, we'll get to that we definitely want to hear um hear about that um how about uh you have some tips uh, even online right well first of all how did you pack for tours okay i just 
Okay, that's right. I gave you a whole list of what I want you to ask me. Now I, I'm, I'm going to appease you with a few of those, and then I go back to my thing. <laughs> okay, so well, how you pack for tours is all those pieces of clothing, maybe that you wear under your regular clothing, just little if they're torn or something, just throw them away. I used to call them throw clothes. So I just never had to wash clothes. I just bring all the clothes I hated, wear a nice coat, and then just throw them. And every once in a while, <laughs> they'd have them wrapped up for me in the next hotel, thinking that I actually <laughs> wanted them, but that's okay. So that's how <laughs> yeah, tours were, were, I miss the touring the most of all. I have the, you know, whenever, I, whenever I'm on, on stage and I, I sometimes discard reads and put them on the floor, go over, off for break, and all of a sudden all the stagehand guys come with my reads. Oh, mister, you oh, forgot. Oh, yeah, reads. I know. And sometimes that's a good thing. Hey, God, that was a good read. I yeah. find yourself going to the wastebasket and saying, hmm, maybe, yeah. <laughs> then that, so touring was, touring was awesome for me. I loved it. What did you, what did you love so much about it? Well, we took a seven-week tour in 1967 from, wow. and ended up in Hong Kong. We were supposed to end up in Japan, but there was wow. a typhoon, so we went to Hong wow. Kong. That was in 1967. So we flew over. We saw the War of Vietnam. We saw the, the lights and the guns. We ended up in a hotel that was boarded up. Greatest food I ever had. So, yeah. 67. That's right. Yeah, I, I, see, I see John Ye online, but unfortunately he hates the food in Hong Kong. I have to say it's a... It, it, oh, it's John doesn't hate him. There's no hate in him. <laughs> well, just, just to put that in historical context, in 1984, they announced that Hong Kong would go to uh, China in 1984. This was 1967. I mean, it wasn't even on the radar then. I mean, it was extremely... It was on my radar. I knew that, you know, in 34 years, 30 years, it's gonna, things were going to change. So it was, wow. it was wonderful there. So, and, <clears throat> by the way, I have, um, and I was going to mention, and I'm so glad to see him, um, a, a fellow Russian off student, a Adam Alter, confided today on when I reposted your poster that you were his first clarinet crush. Um, this is Alex. <laughs> I, I, I don't know who's blushing more, you or Adam, right now. <laughs> okay, but um, now I'm turning red. See? He said he said he he wrote you a letter in 1984 to study with with you, and he still kept your response. What was from 1984? He still has a letter. I think he's 58 now or something. Okay. Really? Oh. Yeah. I I don't know whether you accept him or not. He won't say. But, I, but anyway, for teaching somebody named Adam, but that's. Anyway, I'll find out later. Yeah. Yeah, and and someone else I wanted to say. Speaking of um, Bellison, also mentioned Sydney Forrest's daughter. Yeah. yeah, she she when she paid it, apparently her father, your father, Leon, everyone played in this big clarinet ensemble in New York, yeah. right? And uh, and right. and his father might have called your father. I mean, her father might have called your father, and you answered the phone a few times, and she said he says she was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know. I've been. I used to write him cards, Sydney Forrest. You know, said he liked postcards, old fashioned, no computer. So I'd send him postcards from various places. He was so handsome. I remember that and very good. You know, I have to say that I. He was one of the first clarinet players that I heard a record of. I never listened to clarinet players. You know, I come from an era where my father taught me. I, I mean, I didn't have any. We didn't have record. We had a record player, and I heard like one clarinet player. That was it. That was, and I just was taught by the score. No, even not even the orchestra repertoire studies. So that's how I I just looked at the score. Crazy, huh? Crazy. Without any concept of how other clarinet players played. I, you, yeah, I mean, you're not you're not the first uh, you know great player that I've heard that kind of thing with. You often they've had um, you know heroes of other instruments, which takes me to to a fact that I don't know if this is a well known fact. Wasn't isn't Heifetz Yasha Heifetz a relative of yours, your mother's cousin yeah. or something like that? Yeah, you know, I, I he is he was a cousin, 
And I re remember playing the Coleman auditions, you know, in chamber music, and it was high pitch. There was uh, Piotrgorski, and uh, who was the viol the violist? But anyways, huge primrose. And and I I won. I said, look, Yasha, I ha hate to tell you, this is nepotism. I'm your cousin. He says, I have no family. Oh, okay. That was the punchline oh. of that story. So I mean, <laughs> very very alienated fellow. Yeah. Did, did, I mean, did he come around the house sometimes, or was he quite separate yeah, from your mother? My my dad would play clarinet quartets, quintets with him, but really? he'd have to bring his lunch <laughs> in a paper sack. I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's terrible. It's a real bad gossip. Yeah. So I mean, the word on. I think even if you wanted to make a phone call, you had to put a quarter in the. <laughs> he was very very alienated. But, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, and I, I just want to just cover a few few um, topics, you, quick questions you wanted, and then we're going to go to mine, right? Um, you've written things on how to deal with conductors. Oh, yeah, the tips. Yeah. <laughs> okay. First of all, you, I got, I get bored really easily, so I always have a you know, I always have a comment for the conductors, you know, I, I had a conversation going on for 54 years, but it would only go past the flutes. So that's, I knew how just to go there. So you'd see the two rows laughing <laughs> and everybody's getting, conductors get kind of paranoid, like, God, do I suck? Anyway, so, <laughs> and, and so you don't, don't, you have to learn how to talk. And then if you do have a question for the conductor, you, always have a pencil in your hand because you want to understand, you know, that, that kind of kicks his butt a little bit. And so, I, I mean, I don't remember the tips exactly, but, uh, oh yeah, put your good read on first and then what you do after, just, you don't want to waste the good read, right? So they remember what the good read sounds like. Just take it off after a minute. Just put it away and just put a sort of a similar read on. That, that helps. I mean, I have a lot of tips. I mean, I had to deal with a lot of situations. Imagine yeah. I got it when I was so young. I never went yeah. to a conservatory or anything. I had to learn how to, I had to grow up, but I never grew up because it's just sort of, that was my life. I went from, I was supposed to go to college and then left after 10 weeks. So I just get this job and I'm just sitting there at 18 years old. Mm. Who, who can do anything at 18, right? You just sort of sit there and not screw up a little bit. That was stay under the radar and I had all these emigrates teaching me and all these and my father helping me out so that's how I learned wow amazing yeah we threw you right into the deep end right away no kidding yeah well <clears throat> well who was the music director who hired you nobody I was before Zubin made it so it was a committee uh, I tried out I was, I think, number three, and they didn't know, they don't didn't didn't know who it was, and there was only forty clarinet players trying out then, not four hundred. I don't know if I could ever gotten my job now. It's, it's too, too many people, and they play so great. I mean, I even I played um, Peter and the Wolf, and I think I screwed up a passage, but I I still got in anyway. So it blows my mind a little bit. Well, or or maybe they were looking for something else <laughs> besides yeah. the uh, wrong note. I know. Um, well, so who were all your music directors? I please don't tell me you had a job before this because then the interview's over. Okay, I know. <laughs> I'm still stomaching that you had this job at eighteen. Okay. Yeah, but I had to audition then. When could I? What should I wait till I twenty one? I had to grab that opportunity. Of course. And I lied and I said it was older and so I had Zubin Mehta the next year and that was for 16 years and then um, Giulini mm -hmm. he was wonderful and we had um, actually you know the truth of the whole matter is I just never looked up I don't know who's conducting up there seriously <laughs> don't look up you know it's like you know you can give them a look a little bit of a look and then you just 
crouched down behind the flutes. <laughs> yeah. We had Esapeka, we had Dudamel, we had Previn, but not in that order. Right. Cool. Esapeka was for 17 years. Wow. Esapeka Salonen, yeah. 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 Did, um, who, do you remember all your father's music directors for 24 well, years before you? Sure. I rem Actually, I remember every conductor. I actually wrote it down somewhere that I played under and the conductors he played under. Klemperer wow. was the guy who hired him. Wow. And did, then he got a stroke, stroke so but for a while he was did, very... Didn't you say he actually accompanied your father in, in his audition on the piano? Well, yeah, Bellison told my father, look, I know you wanted to go to Columbia. I want you go. They let you into Columbia. I know you're going to be a dentist and everything. But he was the first of the whole. He was playing first clarinet in the clarinet choir. He says, just write a letter to all the conductors, see if they accept you. So my dad wrote a letter to Klemper and said, "Hi, I want to come join your orchestra." I don't know what he said. <laughs> so Klemper invited him, and and he said, okay, come to my apartment. We'll play some, uh, you know, Brahms or something. And that's that's how he got the gig. Oh. It's amazing. And so he, and, he sorry. Who, who were the music directors uh, between Klepper and when you joined? Well, let's say the great conductors that I played under were Pierre Monteux, who is awesome, and George Zell. And oh. I played him and he had metropolis he had yeah. a lot of great conductors that if you just remember their name and bruno walter so i met bruno walter because he loved my dad too um and he brought me to a concert dad brought me to a concert and they were doing bruno walter bruno walter was doing beethoven ninth and beethoven second and I was getting sleepy. I almost fell into the aisle. I was like, oh my God, is this is what's good. <laughs> and then I went backstage and, and I met Bruno Walter. And then Bruno, it's a funny story. I just remember about the Mozart concerto. So my dad brings up the Mozart concerto to Bruno Walter and says, so what do you think of this? And Bruno Walter says, oh, what a pity. Not such a good concerto. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> didn't like the Mo it's, it's not a Mozart, it's the Mozart, Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a little too long. The first and third movements are too long. Don't you agree? Well, <laughs> they need a cut. <laughs> well, in Amadeus, isn't that what they said? Too many notes or something? Yeah, for salad, salad. yeah right. The, uh, yeah. What was it? Who was it? Who was it? It wasn't, it was the king. Yeah, well, all I can say is uh, you and uh, Walter have very, very high standards if, 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 uh, <laughs> if that's not good I, enough I, for you. <laughs> so that, that, Bruno Walter was, was wonderful, but I didn't know him. Too. I was like 16, so I didn't know him that well. I never yeah. really woke up until I was about 40 anyway. So. <laughs> well, how yeah. do you, so 54 years in the orchestra and, and, and still playing afterwards. I mean, how, what, how did you find the motivation? How did you keep your standard up? Oh, it's fear. It's always fear. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, you don't want to screw up, right? Oh God, I got to do this piece. All right, I got to sound this way. I mean, I had to play under some real bad guys. They were mean suckers. <laughs> they, you know, they, they, see me, they, they see me there and they didn't even want me to play at one time. I'm not kidding. Oh. Oh. Just said, oh my God, what, I won't mention the conductor by name. We're supposed to do the unfinished symphony. I really never finished that symphony, never started it. Because I, <laughs> I don't want her here. What are you doing to me? What's this woman, girl playing? So I got off the stage and my father played. Wow. Me. Yeah, that's yeah. how that, it was a tough time, you know. From 1961 to 71, there were some mean suckers out there. But I, I got through it, you know. Just, I just smile at him. Yeah, that helps. <laughs> well, I mean, so I mean, we can't avoid we can't avoid two 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 um points. I mean, you were the first first chair clarinet player of but a major. That, yeah, yeah, I was sitting first. I was not completely the first. I shared it with Dad, 
Yeah, no, I want to talk about that too because, um, well, for, okay, first of all, you shared it, but you were the first female um, in a major in the United States. And I, I wonder in the world, I don't know. Yeah, in the world. Probably yeah. in the world, yeah. And this is 61. When you think of the sort of, you know, human rights movement, I mean, this is, this is embryonic uh, stages. It it's quite a big deal, I think. Um, and further, I, you were only 18 years old, okay? Um, which also raises eyebrows, I think. Um, so uh, I, first question, did either of those things raise out eyebrows in the orchestra? And did, did they... Did they raise them equally? Were, 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 were there some people sort of intimidated or, or resentment of your age? And were there, other, were there others that were intimidated or resented by your gender or, or, or I think, not? I think so. But I came into that orchestra with two other ladies, one playing assistant oboe and somebody had already been playing. Louise de Tolio was playing a flute. So I had the gender. I didn't, it wasn't so horrible. The 18 year olds, Thing was a little tough but i learned how to deal with all that really well even the woman thing even all that stuff and i found my own conclusions about everything even discrepancy in pay i mean i just learned let's say even you know i just got um the washington post called me up last week a couple oh. weeks ago they said you know you know, the flutist in the, who it was in the New York Philharmonic or somebody who's not getting the same pay as the oboe player, right? I think Boston Symphony probably. Okay, so what happened is, how do you feel about that? I said, I don't know. I had my own thoughts about that. She said, he said then, the reporter, do you want to know this discrepancy and how badly, you were, or so in so many words, how badly you were paid compared to the other players around you? I said, actually, I don't want to know it. You know why? Because there's this woman whose husband lost all the money in the stock market, right? It ruined her life. Do I really want to go living that way of being resentful my whole life or not? I mean, it's, now they should, the young gals now or the gals now should try for that to equal, have everything equal. But at that point, it was already too late. Once you get into an orchestra, and you're there a few years, they're not gonna give you a huge boost in pay. That's mm -hmm. the thing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't wanna be resentful. I didn't want wanna know any of that stuff. I just wanna have a good life and not even think about it. Money is not so important. It's not worth that way. So I just I don't I just say, No, I don't wanna know and I don't care. He kept on pushing me. To, oh. Yeah. So that as far as the pay and as far as being a woman, somehow I just embraced my femininity. I never thought that I would even compete with a man because I just felt like a woman and, and just enjoyed who I am. That's how it happened. It's as simple as that. As soon as you try to be other, something other than yourself, then it's going to be strange to everybody around you. Mm. That's way, it's very different than other people think. So I just said, oh, I'm just not, I feel natural just being a woman. And they felt natural with me because I was natural with myself. Crazy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it worked. Yeah. But the age thing was different. Well, age, you know, it's just after a while, I just got older. It was no problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. That, yeah, that, that, yeah. We have um, our music director, Jan von Sweden, got it, uh, was the concert master of the Concertgebouw at like 19 or 18. Oh, 18, really? 18, 18, yeah. And he said he was, uh, people wrote him merciful, mercilessly, um, the, the 50 year olds behind him. And um, when he did a press interview, he finally put an end to it. His father gave him advice whatever you do, thank them for their support so he got i can't, i just i couldn't have done it without those 50 year olds sitting behind me and from that moment on they let they left them alone that's so great idea yeah. great idea yeah he says sometimes just the daddy i know but that's the other thing how i learned music i had all these old emigres telling me what to do because you know 
that was not so far, you know, in 1945, I got into 1961. I just listened to everybody. I know they might have been jealous and I didn't even notice it. But I, they would say, Michelle, could you play sharper? Could you tongue shorter? You're not tuning with us. You know, all the, the fl first flute would turn around, the bassoon. Nah, the sound is not right. I learned all. I just learned by being there. It was kind of crazy. Well, what, what was it? I, I'm incredibly curious about what it would have been like um, working with your dad on so many levels. I mean, I, like you're talking about <laughs> pages. Yeah, it's wonderful, I'll tell you why. Because I think he might have been scared, but like I had to, my first Hollywood Bowl Orchestra, I, I know I had to do the Liszt Piano Concerto, nice clarinet solo. I could not get a sound out of my horn. Shoot. I said, what's going on? And then, then I looked at the horn. It's like, he put a dime in between the lower joint and the upper joint. Dad did that. He did that to me. <laughs> and then, so I got, I got my revenge. I got that. The next time he had to play something hard, you know that, that cellophane wrap that you put over food. <laughs> that, so he could look through the whole horn, and it still, it, it looked okay. <laughs> so that was our relationship, to be wow. honest. Um, well, I, I, I don't know what to say, but my first question was going to be, did he ever get kind of nervous for you when you got in at 18 and you had something? And, I and think you he were was really nervous. He was nervous, but he didn't let me know. He was cool. He's, he was just, we had our first concert was, <coughs> God, this Gatorade is making my voice a little weird. But anyway, <clears throat> we were doing the Shostakovich 10th with Blind Storff conducting, and uh, it's a he was playing first and I was playing in second and we played in thirds together and did, studied from the score and um, we went over it five billion times and then it just was beautiful, you know, it just it was easy. No so I, that's what I wanted to ask you because I, I don't know of any other orchestra, well, any orchestra um, that had your situation. You had two equal co-principals. OK, um, but only a four person section. So in Europe, for example, or the NHK in Japan, they'll have two principals. They, they split the book half the year and then the rest of the section. But um, you guys, you know, and, and as far as I know, all the American orchestras have a clear principal or, and then associate principal or assistant sure. principal. And so forth. But you guys didn't have that. Andy didn't have the five person section. Um, You're right. But then. Okay, but what you said is sometimes you play second to um, to your father. Is that what you said? Sure, sure. He was the king. I, I later later on it was co-principals because Zubin Mehta wanted to do it that way because there were some weak players. But before then it was principal and associate, which I was or assistant. Ah, and, okay. So yeah. you started as the assistant. I see. Oh yeah. Otherwise, I could not have gotten in. I'm not like Stanley coming in on first chair at 17. No. But, By uh, the way, yeah. no, Stanley didn't come in on first chair. He was assistant in E flat. What? Bernstein uh, moved him up seven or eight oh, years yeah. later. But you, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, but he yeah. was he was principal in Indianapolis and Buffalo before that. But well, that's a, he's a genius, you know. So. No, but again, trust me, eight, eight, 18 is assistant in, in LA is not terrible. <laughs> that, you had your work cut out for you. Yeah, uh, I know. Yeah. I'd wake up in the morning and I'd just say, yes, you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. You have you have so many fans on here sending their regards. Let's say we have Nicholas Balderu. We have John Ye, of course, who, by the way, everyone, I understand that you were a teacher of his in, for a summer. And, you know, I, both of you have this young looking gene. Is that what you taught him, basically? I yeah. did to 20, 30 okay. years younger than your age. I, I just part Asian, you know, it's, it goes with the territory. Yeah, I taught him, for some, I taught him Yettle, the hardest exercises in the world. And that sucker, I mean, Ednaldo's playing Yettle now. That, if you could get through Yedl at the Tempe written, that's Arnold Schwarzenegger of the clarinet, really. I mean, that, so that's what uh, John Ye 
And he'd come in every week, like perfect. I didn't have him do it up the temple, so don't feel bad. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, but by the way, we've got Charlie Nightache and Ayako tuned in. We've got Frank Cohen here. We've got Hi, uh, guys. Pascual Martinez for the New York Phil. Um, Esteban? Or Esteban? Oh, yeah. Our principal trumpet of Chicago Symphony who used to be in the Hong Kong Philharmonic was watching. We, we've got all kinds of our second player, uh, Wei Lau and Nick Cox uh, for the UK. And just. Oh, yeah, just ton, oh. tons and, and oh, and and Sharon Williams, the uh, piccolo player with the London Symphony, used to play with Hong Kong Phil. So we've got all kinds of, um, you know, Diana Haskell uh, from, from oh, yeah. St. Louis Symphony. So we've got uh, tons of fans here of yours, really appreciating everything you've got to say so far. Oh, oh Eugene Isatoff is here. Everybody, oh, God. <laughs> so, wonderful I, didn't have to, I, I, I can't go through everybody, but anyway, so you know. I, we're all enjoying your, your words of wisdom here. Um, so let's, let's have a quick shout out. I love going back into the mass, the old guys, right? Now your dad was your primary teacher. You had four lessons with Mitchell Laurie and four lessons with Leon Rushenoff. Let's have a little bit of a shout out for them and can just share what that was like. What, if there's anything you took from them or, or oh, any impressions did, you did. had from them. Yeah. I, th I think Laurie was a great cheerleader. cheerleader. You know, and actually, Leon, too, he may yeah. inspire you to sound really good. He said, wow, this sounds fantastic. And he would show me ways of practicing technical passages, like, uh, you know, the technique of it and how you're supposed to hold your fingers. And he told yep. me every, every about Leon, and he says at the very end of the four lessons, he says, you know, you're playing all wrong, but it huh. sounds good, so just forget it. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks for the encouragement of that. And then with Lurie, it was like, he was just, he brought you up to his level of, of enthusiasm. He was a great artist. He, he taught me how to, where to breathe in the phrases that would not be noticeable. And with mm. a, a great concept of sound, they both had great concepts. Yeah. I mean, natural teachers. I mean, those two are natural teachers. Yeah. It's hard to be a natural teacher. Mm. Do you know, I mean, Ednaldo studied with me, and it's just the hardest thing for me to do is to teach. You know why? Why? Because my the way I studied with my father is like, and I mentioned it before, it's like I'm a cobbler's assistant. He would just do, he would grind out the, the, the shoes. I would just follow. I don't know. I just imitated him without even knowing it. I don't know where my father left off and I began. It's just a continuous way without any words as far as sound, as far as phrase, as far as sound and phrasing. I, this is it's crazy. But uh, the way my father taught and the way that Bellison taught, it was very special because they would make a, they would make a story, for instance, the Weber variations. So the story would be this young man is meeting his girlfriend of course, that's not what Weber had in mind, but it doesn't matter. It's just a story. <laughs> <coughs> um, so they make a story. They outline the phrases. I have Bellison's writings where there's not one note that doesn't just sit there, but it, the whole thing comes together. And, I mean, he didn't just say, oh, play. No, everything was organized. Crescendi, the, piece, the peak of the piece. And when I studied with my father, all the architecture stood out. I don't know how he taught. I don't know how it ended up sounding good. He taught me the Weber concertino. It's like, wonderful. I well, can't do that. Was he a natural teacher like, like Rushenoff and Lurie? They, got, they all got the gift. I'm not a natural teacher. It's very hard for me to teach. I'm a great coach. Well, you've had quite a, I, I mean, you've had a reasonably thorough uh, teaching career over the years. I know you've given master classes. Oh, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. You can kind of fake it then, you know. You know, you know play a little legato there, you know. I mean, but I mean, for general, you know, week by week teaching, that is a job for the gifted like Yehuda. Not, not for me. It's just too hard. I, I have to be honest. 
just telling all in front of everybody. There <laughs> is, it is a gift, don't you think? You agree? Yeah. And yeah. yeah. How many teachers do you, and you know, as far as why I sounded so good and musical or whatever, you, however you might think, is I had all those emigres screaming at me and all those, <laughs> All those guys in the orchestra, ah, God, good game. Can't you play a little? Can't you listen? And why are you so flat? And you know, I had that all the time for, for years until I got him fired, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me ask you did, um, I mean, the, I, I'm intertwined. We want to give you as much attention as possible, but for me personally, this is this... yeah, anything, anything. No, no, no. But for me personally, I ha I really have this um, thing about connecting people a little bit to the to the older masters, the well, the teachers that we were talking about, or the or the um, conductors or whatever. So um, feel free, just as as you said, when you played with your father or learn from. You didn't know where he finished and where you began. So you know, just chime in when we're talking about. If I ask you a question about some your experiences if, if you remember something about your father's that, that's relevant please please mention it because i'm trying to document as much historical um information right. as, as possible so what i'm going to ask you is um right away i, I will get to the solo stuff but right away did did either you or your father perhaps um perform a world premiere of a famous symphony or, or orchestra piece um, at, one, at one point. I mean, we all do premieres, I guess, but something that became quasi standard or standard repertoire today. Well, my father, I think he did the first uh, Copeland in the West Coast, Copeland Concerto. He, my wow. father did, did a lot of contemporary music. He huh. did tons of premieres. I did the Messian Quartet for It's Time to End <laughs> um, <laughs> on the West Coast. And uh, uh, Corigliano, the second premiere on the West Coast. Oh. But my father, yeah, I think he did. Yeah, he did a lot. My father loved contemporary music. And he loved reading The Nation. Two things that I just didn't care for at all. <laughs> bored me to tears, you know. <laughs> like he loved all that contemporary music. And I'm just thinking, oh, that's great. I'd go to every concert he ever went, played at, you know, at uh, Pomona. He taught out there, and I, and it's just like he made the music, the contemporary music, sound like wrong note Brahms. It was just beautiful. Well, excuse me, I'm not sure if John Ye is correcting you. He's throwing out Piero Luner. Oh my God! How sorry. Thank you, thank you. My father did the first recording of Schoenberg's Piero Luner. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> that's that's not nothing. <laughs> that's, not, that's and I think the. Who was the cellist? Uh, anyway, it was just a very, very well-known cellist. So wow. um, Fournier, it might have been Fournier or something, but it was just like really top. For, for, for your mom? For your mom. Oh, it might have been for your mom. I'd have to check the record. I don't even have the record now. I so live in the present. I don't live in the past. I'm one of those kind of people. But um, isn't it terrible? There's people that live in the future, people that live in the past, and I'm learning to live in the present. It's funny. I just do that. It's just easier. Well, it, it, that's great. the best way. No, no, they say that's the best way. I, I have problems with that, but I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, but just say like um, Eckhart told the power of now. Just enjoy the day. You know, that's what, kind of my philosophy lately. So, but anyway, so I don't, I don't think about the past. So much. Oh yeah. Oh, everybody's saying yeah. Feuerman. I got everybody's. Oh yeah. Everybody's saying Brahms. Pierre Lunaire. Yeah. Well, well you know, Brahms. Oh, okay. So so yeah. Do you want it? What uh, Adams? They say. He said he also did very famous. Uh, my father did very famous uh, film scores cool. too. Yeah. Well, actually, I think that's really interesting. E e even for myself. I mean, growing up on the East Coast. Um, as a youngster, there was a this sort of promised land, this this image of the Hollywood scene in LA. And between your from you know when your dad had his start to to now, I guess you, there's a huge evolution of what that was like for musicians. First of all, could you could you just explain a little bit 
about that. And, uh, and second of all, as I understood it, maybe members of the LA Phil were involved in that sort of thing at one point, but it became a little bit separate. I really don't know. I shouldn't, I shouldn't speak, but I'd like I'll to speak about it. And many years ago, I mean, they had the equivalent of four orchestras in the studios, and it was better. It was a better gig to do studio work. <coughs> the pay was better, and it was interesting, you know, uh, to play in these studios. So those studio players were very well-known people like Mitchell Lurie was playing for clarinet. You just name all of these guys. Um, and then you had the L.A. Philharmonic. And there was sort of a separation there. Yeah, of course. So when, when was this? This would have been in the 50s, 40s, 50s. Okay, so, so this that, is your, father, your father's era. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So, so, I mean, so there was a separation. But now, then they sort of, sort of, I mean, now the L.A. Philharmonic guys, they played in the studios at a certain point, too. So it's just... Uh, is it was interesting, but it was uh, the Philharmonic was a little bit second rate compared to the studio. Oh, so if so, if Adam Alter says your father did a lot of well known film scores, he he belonged to that camp, uh, a LA film person who also did a lot of these sorts of things, right? Right, right, wonderful. That was a time, and you, I did, um, I did a few, but I found that, um, found that a little boring too. I, I liked it. I have to be honest. You know, I mean, I don't, John, I like John Williams scores. I mean, he wrote me that clarinet concerto, but um, generally not so, not so interesting for well, me. Okay. Now you can't, you can't just say, oh yeah, he wrote me that clarinet concerto and say, oh yeah, whatever. Okay. Now let's go back a little bit. <laughs> John Williams wrote you a clarinet concerto, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I can say something besides yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean... Okay, I, what was it? Did the orchestra commission... Did they no, say no, we no, want... No, no, no. <clears throat> I gotta get... You wanna get me some water? Sure. Yeah, from the kitchen. Thanks. Um, thanks. Um, what happened is... I, I love the way John Williams writes. And I love... The way, you know, we had the same background with the Kempinski trio. He studied with the pianist. We had that same feeling of nuance and phrasing. And I thought, wow, I want a clarinet concerto from you. So I kind of begged him, please write me a piece. And so he did. And so in 1991, I played it with the Riverside Symphony and then later on with the Boston Pops. And uh, he didn't like it, unfortunately. So I said, God, you don't want to. I sent him a tape and you know of it and he just he says nah it's a stinker i liked it i liked it a lot but it, it was like he, when sometimes when john williams wrote he said mm, i better write some classical music and really i didn't want that i wanted stuff from like 1941 or some you know i still wanted movie music but he didn't write music movie music unfortunately and so thank you sir thank you sir so, so um, basically, John Williams wrote a clarinet concerto, which has been performed only two times by you yeah. and unpublished yeah. and at the end of it, yes? Well, I played it, uh, parts of it in the convention where I met Dave Blumberg and he recorded it. Yeah, he, he was a fan of it. So, yeah. so, so you, okay, so you it's been performed three under five times. I know. I know. No, I'm asking you. What do you mean? Don't you agree with me? I'm trying well, to. Clarify. I know, but I just. I, I just <laughs> but he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to let it out. He doesn't want anyone to play it. So you're the only person who's played it, and it's only been played a handful of times. Mm -hmm. And it's unpublished. That's that's a remarkable fact. It's, it's a remarkable just, fact. It's so sad in a way, and and I, you know, I want John Ye to record it one day, so. He what says he you? likes it. He says he likes it. Jim Cantor is he finds this fascinating. He says hello. Lots of people, lots of fans here. I know, him. I know. I'm a little yeah, I I underspeak about all this stuff, but it was wonderful. It was exciting to learn this piece. I had this, piece. this was just you personally. You just literally said to him, Listen, would you mind writing me a concerto? And that was yeah. the end of it. Yeah, he didn't charge me or anything. 
And it, wow. Like, I know. And I got, I set up an orchestra for him to play it in. I did, somebody else wrote me, uh, um, Barrio wrote me a, he's supposed to write me a concerto. Oh, okay. really Wait, so that was through the LA Phil or not? That LA Phil, that was commissioned by the LA Phil. Okay, so, right. Carry on. Yeah, so Barrio was supposed to write me a concerto. I'm thinking, wow. Okay, time's getting shorter. It's like a half a year. What concerto? Turns out to be an orchestral arrangement of the Brahms Sonata Number no. One. So I just put it in my master weeks, master works of clarinet, Brahms first sonata, and then he had some Nino Roto like beginning. You know, it's like, oh wow, this is incredible. I feel like I'm in, in Italy, in, in Italian Brahms for about forty minutes, forty measures, and then. It just goes now. Here's the hassle. Ever trying to project <laughs> with a sort of for the it was like all throat notes. So what do you do? You're playing it like this, na da da, because you can't project with anything. I mean, I didn't have needed a microphone at the time. So I played. I was supposed. I I played that four times with Ellie Phil to commission. Oh, well. So. That was, uh, is that the only time you've ever played it? Um, let me think. No, I did the piano version many times. <laughs> no, <laughs> I only time I did it with orchestra. Yeah, I th I think uh, a, f a few other clarinet players that actually have recorded it. So yes, but how about the second um, sonata? He did. He also transcribed that. Um, did he? He didn't yeah. tell me. About Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting too because he, there's an introduction uh, to it there, you know, which obviously it starts differently than the, than the first uh, sonata. So okay, so I won't bad subject. I was going to ask you if you performed that one as well. Oh, but, seriously, uh, the second sonata that he yeah, 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 no yeah. kidding, it's son yeah. of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you like the did you like it the first sonata uh, other than the, the other than the technical. Yeah, I loved, it. I loved it. Yeah, loved it. It's just that when you're in the you throat, work. you know, and these mm. nuances that you work out with the piano, it's a little hard to project as a concerto, you see. So, it yeah, it was fun though. Barrio was there. It was kind of groovy. But I haven't done too much, too, too, too much other than just these concerti, a couple of concerti. Mostly, I, my thing is orchestra repertoire. God, do I know that rep repertoire? Sure. Oh my God, it's incredible. It's just sort of like I, I turned into this factory worker, you know, where I could just play the whole 150 years of repertoire, or I'm able to name a piece. I mean, I could you hear it on the radio in one second, I could tell you what it is because I just know it so very well. Can you imagine no, not going to a conservatory? This was my conservatory from 18 to 21 playing, you know, Brahms Symphony Number no. 3 or Galanta dances, anything. Wow. Never yeah. even heard how it was supposed to go. I just played it. Amazing. But my coach me, so. Yeah. Incredible. The, um, what was it? Uh, well, actually, I, I had a misconception about you because I always knew you as that person in LA that played the German clarinet, okay? But yeah. I, I had this idea that somehow you learned it from scratch, but you actually started on the French, you started the job on the French right. and changed after how many years? I, I, how many years in the job? 10 years. Oh, a decade or so, what? I was, uh, let's see, I, 1970 I changed. It's a funny story. Nine years, yeah. Yeah, well, my husband also played clarinet, great clarinet player, first husband, not Jim. And um, we he was taught by his father, Peter Zukowski, who studied with Lindemann, who was a great clarinetist in the Chicago Symphony. So you both learned from your fathers? Yes. Yeah, wow. And so he had that background, and I had the background of Bellison, Russian school, and he drew... Yeah. And both Lindemann and Belson played German system. So we had that in our ears a little bit. And so we went to Germany, thought, wow, I like the way Leister's sounding. Already I was starting to hear clarinet playing and it sounded good, it sounded really good. So uh, we just went to Germany and just 
we didn't know what, where to ask or what to do. So we were driving around. We went to a, we heard somebody, um, you know, in these core orchestras, these little summer orchestras was playing a Wurlitzer. Oh, I wanted to ask him, but what are you playing? Sounds good. And he, it was different. So I, we, but we found it. He said, guys, Wurlitzer, the name of the clarinet is a Wurlitzer. And, and he said, Neustadt, Neustadt Eich. So where's that? I don't know. There's a lot of Neustadt Eich. <laughs> <laughs> Late in the evening, we find the right Wurlitzer and Neustadt Eich. Because, you know, you ask the guys in Neustadt Eich, do you know where uh, the street is? And they never know because they just live there, right? I don't know. So somehow we found it. Met Wurlitzer. And I started out with a sort of an open mouthpiece, like a French mouthpiece. And, and Charles actually ordered a German clarinet. And then I ordered a reform broom. I love the German mouthpiece. It's awesome. It's easy. You don't have to bite. You know, it just goes, you just go like this, whoo, and it gets a nice sound. You don't have to do anything. So I was like, oh my God, I got to play this for the rest of my life. Because the mouthpiece, <laughs> they were sucking when I was a kid. They weren't good like the Van Dorns are. I didn't have any Van Dorns. I had old, grimy old Caspers that never worked, you know, so. So I turned, got onto that mouthpiece, played a buffet with a German mouthpiece. Was very out of tune, but with a beautiful sound. So played that for a year, and then I switched to a reform berm for a few months, and then I heard Charles play on a, the, the uh, Erler system. That was it for me. It's so interesting, so wonderful. Hard to play. You lose 30% of your technique forever. Oh. But I had, a, I had a lot of techniques, so it was okay. It was a, you know, orchestra repertoire. You don't need a great, you don't need technique anyway. <laughs> and then you go ahead and play the uh, number two performers of the Carigliano on the German clarinet, right? Yeah, I don't yeah. know, man. Practice that. Music. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> but some of the music is easier on the German system. For instance, Strauss worked with... Um, I think he worked with Erler, just to make it, you never have to practice Strauss, never have to practice Beethoven, never ha always sounds great on Beethoven and Strauss and Brahms and like the whole German repertoire, which is way better, honestly. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm convinced. Um, now, I, I, I mean, like you were saying, the mouthpieces didn't work back then and stuff. I, I would imagine in, the 60s or 70s, it wasn't that easy to ha to to sort of get yourself into the German equipment. He, he's like, you were always going to Germany? I, mean, I would think that there was a lot of experimentation. Yeah. Going on. No, I yeah. never did. I found before, which is sort of an in-between German and a French. Just loved it. I never fussed. So I just, um, I got to tell you what it was like to study with my father and when I first started studying with him. Please do. Please. <coughs> so when I was younger, I was just a tomboy and I just play ball against his, I would just play tennis against his studio. That was my connection with dad's studio. <laughs> <laughs> and then one day, I, you know, my father was a mouthpiece freak. You know, every night he'd change his mouthpiece. He wouldn't always buy reeds because he was really cheap, but those mouthpieces. <laughs> And every night, there was just like little, little black things all over the place. So one day I walk in, you know the story? You probably know it. No, no. Oh, okay. Maybe some people. So I walk in and I just picked up the clarinet and I played it. Oh. Huh. Left it up. I went, boom. Sounded great. Dad looked at huh. me and said, what mouthpiece are you playing? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I don't know. It's flat. So this is the first time you ever played the clarinet, the little kid throwing the ball at, at the thing. You played it, and your dad wants to know your setup. Like, oh, that sounds. <laughs> it was his. Don't you know what he. Anyway, so it was a Stone Wells and Schneider. I remember that. But anyway, yeah, he was a. Sometimes I'd go on vacation, you know, I was playing the French. And I was, we'd be up in San Francisco. And Dad would call me and say, could you come down? Why? 
Uh, you got the Casper, the Ann Arbor one. I, I can't, I want to play that. So I'd like go home, break up the vacation and bring the mouthpiece back. You know, he was just nuts. So I, I'm the opposite. I don't fuss. You know, if the mouthpiece feels kind of okay, you know, I, I just don't change much. I, I believe that. I don't, I don't know. It's just my way of thinking. Parents are always a template of how not to be, so. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very hard to raise parents, I must say. <laughs> um, are you, um, well, okay, so for, for, for um, you know, uh, Philistines like me that didn't know your story, if I wanted to hear you on what you sounded, I've always known you as the German kind of, so, you know, terrific and different and everything. But if I wanted to hear you on the French clarinet, there's nine years that you did in the LA Phil. Are there any That's recordings? There what? are, uh, Mother Goose. It's, you know, wow. here's the bitch of the whole thing. I record Mother Goose with Zubin. And then I record Mother Goose with Giulini on the German system. I can't oh. even hear, I can't hear the difference. It's pathetic. No, that's- it's so sad. I play your setup. It just feels the same, you know. But with the, here's the good thing about the German system. I was really going off the rails with the French system. And the German system, you have to play the right way. You can't just blow. You have to support because the top showing is not, it's more cylindrical. It doesn't, doesn't make it so easy to play. So you're, you're always supporting just to play the damn thing. But it just sounds so, it sounds so nice, but you have to practice more. Otherwise, it sounds very not nice, you know. With the French, you can get away with murder. But if I were to just pick up this clarinet now, I don't have a read. Maybe I have a read. And it's just going to sound good no matter what. After, you know, but you but to sound really good, you have to practice two hours a day on it. That's the problem. And I don't, because it's just, for what? So, but I have homemade reeds and a beautiful, you know, a nice German mouthpiece. And it's just, it's just wonderful. And you, if you play it right, it's hard to sound bad on a German. Well, you're, well I disagree, actually. I've heard some pretty funny. <laughs> 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 just <laughs> <bring this up. laughs> There's one concerto that came out. And this is a German guy. He just, he had no idea of sound. And the, I can't remember his name, but I wouldn't tell you anyway if you put a gun in my hand. It was just like the most narrow, hideous little sound. I don't know. So my concept is more a combination of German and Viennese. You know, it's not, it's Amer I'm an American player, just coming from the German side. I'm not a German player. Have you ever played a, a Viennese uh, instrument? Yeah, I play, I recorded the concertino on a Hammerschmidt. Huh. Yeah. And, and so how different does that feel from a from a German? It's still about the same. Uh -huh. I, you know, if you get the right read. So it's just, yeah. I like the Hammerschmidt sound as well. It's just different. It's more commercial. Okay. Yeah. So the German, no, no. System, the German system can sound a little, you know, if you don't tame it. Okay, I'm so I, I, I'm, just, I'm just, hold on. I'm just trying to do the math here. So, so. If I want to hear Michelle Zukowski on a Viennese clarinet, I can hear her on Weber Concertino, right? A recording have, of it. It's half a tone sharp. That's why I didn't continue with it. Yeah, and... Uh, and, and, and hold on. And, and we can hear Mother Goose Sweet on the French clarinet with, with uh, Ruben Maida. Okay. Yeah, uh, and, can, and German everything is, uh, that pretty much is, is German. So we can actually hear you on all the you know major schools of, of, of clarinet. Yeah, but I have that sound in my ear. Exactly. So whatever, it's all going to sound the same, basically. It's whether it's easier to, to make it happen or not. That's all yeah. it's. Yeah. What a fantastic lesson, right? Everyone gets so wrapped into this and this. At the end of the day, you're, you're playing literally completely different system clarinets, and still that's what's coming through. So go ahead. Right. Absolutely. And the, the thing for me for the French system I always found that I never, I could get tired quick 
And so a lot of those French players, they lose their sound when they're older. I, 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 it's my, I know it sounds wrong, but generally, don't you kind of agree a little bit? They lose their sound when they're about 70 or 80. Well, uh, listen, I, you know how many enemies I make naturally? I'm not going to let you okay, so, <laughs> get me. No, in. but then there's exceptions like Kahuzak, you know, and then where'd that guy come from? You have all these guys that have great sounds at 70 or 80. But I know for me, it was beginning to feel that I was not going to have a good sound at the age of 50 if I didn't switch to a closer mouthpiece. That's all that is. Yeah, so that's, that's why I switched. Um, so, do you, I mean, do you, you know, you said you play, you play down the teaching, especially now, but I mean, through the years, you've done quite, a, I imagine you have had students and regular students that, you know, what, that you've had for three, four years at a time. Or, oh, yeah. Or, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and so think... let's talk a little bit about that. I'm, I'm sure that, that that's not nothing. I mean, that, that's, uh, there's been a big part of your your career and I know you've done massive that I that I know because I know you've done them in New York and stuff. I think Leon was involved sometimes and and well, here's like a story with the with my teaching is I loved making money on the side, so I started teaching. <laughs> so, so I was like, wow! I started teaching when I was fourteen, so I just like Whoa. yeah, and I would teach little kids, and one of them was a thief. I remember she'd come in. And she started wearing my jewelry, something that she, she took off my jewelry. It was crazy. I said, that, that's mine. She said, found it on the street. No, honey, that's mine. Stop taking my stuff, you know. But I, so anyway, so I. Yeah, I so you, much for making money on the side. Lost a little bit. Right after those lessons, right? But I like teaching them and I like. I like some. I like the kids until they take the clarinet out of the case. But no, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like fun to hang out with them. God, oh God, you're gonna play, especially students where they have no rhythm. That's a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. you, do you have problems with that teaching them rhythm if they don't have good rhythm? What do you do? Says that's a hard. Well, thing. I, I, I have a, I have a system of. Um, of, of uh, legal offenses in music. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said, look, 99.7%, right, is hitting the big beats, right? The big beats. Doesn't yeah. matter if, if your tone's good, it doesn't matter if you're in tune, doesn't matter if, if you hit all the notes, right? If, if you miss the big beat, that's a felony, okay? That's a <laughs> felony, right? You right out of traffic ticket? Well, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the traffic ticket is just like missing a dynamic or something. That's just a misdemeanor, okay? So we have a whole bunch. So we shout out felony misdemeanor. This, do you, you know, really do that? Yeah, of course. So you know? <laughs> I'm a frustrated lawyer, you know. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> no, no, but, but but that is everything. That that that's what I have to. I said no matter what, in the metronome is everything and and the worst thing is when the metronome's on and they start sort of um you, you know they, they get off or, or with it they're not paying attention i said listen it's like an alarm clock okay if you start teaching yourself to not pay attention you're going to sleep through it you need to always respect the metronome you know and then of course uh, you got to take the metronome away because that could become a laxative. You could you could do it great with the metronome, but once you get off the laxative, can you go back on the on the toilet? You know, same thing. <laughs> you gotta you gotta train yourself first to respect the metronome, and then you gotta wean yourself off of it. So you know. it's hard. I mean, because I'm teaching kids now that are not the highest level because I'm not teaching at USC anymore. Because first of all, the kids at USC wanted to study with Yehuda. And, you know, what's the point? After a while, it just didn't make sense for me to be there. So I just thought, oh, I'll teach low-income kids, you know. And so I have sort of, their, their playing isn't so good as, as the at USC. So I have to, I have the basics. I have to teach them the basics. So it, it's like, God, it's hard teaching students that are like that. It's very hard. Because at USC, by the time they get to USC, they have everything covered. So anyway. So that's, that's, my life is a little different now. But when they don't have, if they can't go, 
daro to the next. I heard another teacher say, just rest on that note. Da rest. And then he, he, that was a, a great a guy named Bosco who taught in Monterey or something. That, you know, some another great born teacher. You know, they have it. I, I respect those kind of people. Mm. So it's hard. You have to be very patient. You have to not kill them, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, great advice. Okay, everybody, we we got something out of this interview. Don't commit murder. <laughs> you just go, oh. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's the first key to success, everybody. <laughs> Don't commit murder. So that's. Which is still, Michelle, that's still not as bad as missing the big beat, though. That's a real felony. <laughs> what do you, what, yeah. What do you do? That never, you, that person, I decided what I was going to do with her. What I'm going to do with this girl is I'm going to teach her how to teach young, young kids. They won't know that their teacher doesn't have such, you know, great rhythm. It's all right. The best thing you teach them is they get a good tone. Somehow, that's how they, if you have a good, the, if you play for them a lot, you can get them to get a good tone, right? Ed Naldo's a great teacher, by the way. Oh, yeah? I'm, yeah, I haven't teach for him. I was teaching in one college, and, you know, I took two weeks off, and the kids were playing okay. And then he's teaching, and then, oh, my God, they sound great. I got, he sounds fantastic. This is Ed Naldo. Say hi, everybody. Yeah, uh, Ed Oh my God! He look, he's he's cute. He scares the girls. He's <laughs> in, no, he's he's really wonderful. I I can't believe he wants to transcribe all these things into Portuguese so his uh, compatriots in, in in Brazil can listen to all these people's words of wisdom. So I mean, he's he's a terrific uh, contributor, and uh, yeah. you know, he really I is. I was yeah. so embarrassing when I, I had a few students from Brazil, and I said, "Yeah, I'd like to learn Brazilian." I mean, this is how oh, <laughs> Brazilian. <laughs> <Here you go. laughs> <laughs> so, I, what got you? Probably, you got, you're not asking me a question like, "How did I get through 54 years without killing somebody?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah how, how did that... Listen, dude, we gotta stop get on this murder topic, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're, we're expecting like profundities. The key to success is this and that, and you just keep on going back to murder, okay? <laughs> just. <laughs> <laughs> no, like we had this one conductor because I always crack jokes like all the time, nonstop. <laughs> I wouldn't know who that was, right, <laughs> Lorenzo? Yeah. <laughs> no, this guy Tielemann, ever hear of him? He's kind of oh, great. Yes, yeah. yes. You know, if you played under him, I I, I he... haven't played under him, but but I, I I know of him very well. Yeah. <laughs> so he's conducting us, and and we're doing Brahms second, and. This man should be first in the all, he should be conductor of the all world's orchestra, but he has a little bit of a disagreeable personality. Uh oh, I shouldn't say negative things, right? No, no, are you kidding? <laughs> Bring it on. So, <laughs> whatever, so listen, we're doing anything Brahms, that makes you comfortable. Okay, is okay, so we're doing Brahms second, which is the symphony that's like so easy to want to deal with. It. But anyway, so he's conducting, he says, Oh no, it sounds like shice, you know, no, no good, no good. Oh, no, here, no. And he says, oh, what is the word for this word? You know, oh, I wanted to tell you this. And he was acting like such a turkey. So I finally said, don't bother learning the language. You're not coming back, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, oh, it's great. You know, it's the things you can say it. You know, that's wonderful. When you got when I got older, I could say anything. Just like, yes, yeah. yeah. The the filters start disintegrating a little. <laughs> and there's nothing you can do because I had a good read on. If you have, <laughs> you can say just about anything. You conductor you know. repellent. You read right. <laughs> I know it's true. God, we buddy was right, man. You need a good read to yeah. just, to get through life. So yeah. he always a good read, don't you think? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I, I hate to speak ill of the dead, but I guess I have to hate him. <laughs> what was that a good read? Yeah. At least I hate it. Yeah. And so 
that's what I did. I cracked up. That's how I got through it. I just cracked up everybody all the time because otherwise, what would you do? What's what's the point of living if you can't mm -hmm. laugh? But we had we had great conductors. This orchestra, great conductors. Who, I love who sticks out? Like, who really made an impression okay. on? You? Okay, I had a list somewhere. <laughs> that yeah, that right. would be the question, right? <laughs> if you can't find your reading glasses, you forget them all, right? Yeah, right. Oh God, I can't hear you. Like, okay, Gergiev, that Russian guy. Yeah. Wow. yeah. He was um Lorenzo's boss at at the LSO. How many years? Uh, six years. Six years. He, he Lorenzo worked with him. Yeah, Gergiev. What did he think? What did you think? Amazing. Amazing, he said. Amazing. Amazing. And here's another one. Maris Janssen. He, he yep. passed away. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Now, here's one that you guys never worked with, which is Stravinsky. I, I recorded. Did you with work Stravinsky. with Stravinsky? Yeah. And so did Dad. Dad oh. said, hey. Oh, 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 oh. You just, you, that just slipped your mind. Thanks a lot, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. By, by the way, you might have heard of this Stravinsky yeah. guy. You know, no, maybe no, I should work with Stravinsky. No, he, so I said, "Hey, Igor, I want to play. I want to play the three pieces for you." So my dad goes up to the house, <laughs> and he did not. He said, "Mr. Stravinsky." Now, my father was very formal. I had to teach him how to swear, really. <laughs> <laughs> and then when he pronounced the words, it was all like weird, like a foreign language. So nobody was saying, <laughs> no. <laughs> so anyway, so my dad plays the first piece, first all three pieces in Stravinsky said, oh, beautiful. Just play the first uh, first piece again. And then he stands up with a pencil, pencil at the very last, the last second to the last measure. Second to the last measure of the first moment, he gets a pencil and he writes piano. Well, I, I don't have it, but it's when it goes, but oh, you have to play that soft. That's the last second, the second to the last measure of the first note. E, e so, flat to D, grace note to D, is that yeah, four yeah. to? Exactly. And I mean, I playing with Stravinsky was amazing. Did, did he, he had, mostly his own works or only his own works that you were only, only his own works. So, you know, if he did Petrushka, it was like he'd get up and there'd be energy. Ah, he had rhythm. He had 132. I could feel that he could, everything was so rhythmical. That's, it was just like, I felt the rhythm from him and the intensity and the brilliance and the fireworks and the, you know, it was so Russian that way. So, and he lived here for many years in Hollywood, not too far away from Sternberg. Uh huh. They never hung out, you know. They didn't like each other particularly. Yeah, I heard. So yeah. Sternberg was busy thinking twelve tone and, uh, you know, cod liver oil kind of thinking. Very, not a lot of fun, Sternberg. But Stravinsky was like swigging mm. the vodka, and then coming back and. Recording some more. He was a cool guy. Wow. Never nasty, friendly. We recorded a lot with him. Really? Yeah. Wow. He didn't talk. He didn't, he didn't talk much. Oh God! Joshua said, "I love sitting next to Michelle in rehearsals. She is totally unfiltered." Uh, I'm filtering now. I'm filtering, Josh. I, I, Josh and I have a, a remarkable um, back. This is Joshua Renz. A remarkable background. I, I went to a high school in um, in um, uh, the suburbs of New York City. The population of the town is under nine thousand, and uh, we both went to the same school. And uh, I vaguely remember him. He he was sort of I come back to to uh, visit, and he might have been a, a fifth grader or something like that. So we actually went to the same, you know, t very very tiny school, um, you know, way out outside of New York City and here we are <laughs> all connected right now it's your Isn't that funny? In fact, who's your who's your second who was the second clarinetist in um LA Phil? Merritt, Merritt Buxbaum. 
Actually, I'll tell you all the clarinet players that play in the section. No, but who, who is it now? It um, Andrew Loy. Loy. Yeah, I, I, I believe he went to the same high school. How do you like that? Yeah, a bunch of smart guys kind of come from that area. Josh, yeah. is, he's a little too smart. Yeah, I yeah. just, <laughs> and you too. But yeah, so the, the Philharmonic players were dad, me, Lauren Levy played there for a good many years. You know, everyone knows who yes, he is. Yeah. Yeah, I really did not like him for a variety of reasons, mostly because he had such an incredible technique. It was just like, and, that, and that he, it was a career extender for me because if I saw something that I couldn't sight read right away, baby, it's yours, Lauren. Come here, just play it for me because what would take me a month would take you two days to learn. And so he could just lay it down. He could just read the paint off the wall. An amazing I, player. I, I, I met him once. I, uh, I was in a fellow in the New World Symphony, their opening season. And I remember we were trying... We were trying barrels. He really likes the barrels and everyone's doing it. And I still remember I did a solo from Beethoven 4 and I used a fake fingering for the high D flat. All I remember is, it, is he started, he started wait, hissing me. Lauren? Lauren? You were playing Lauren, Lauren? Lauren Levy. Yeah. Yeah. So he was, he came in as a coach. I mean, we're talking 32 years ago or something. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I remember I used the fake fingering and he started hissing me. <laughs> okay. Oh, did he really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he things you don't remember about people, right? I got to say, he was a joy to work with. Him. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you never, because you never use fake fingerings on that German thing. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, are you kidding? <laughs> but yeah, he was a he was a genius, another genius. So 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 there was Lauren Levy. Who else was in the Philharmonic? Uh, Dave. David Howard's there now, bass clarinet, the best yeah. bass clarinet. You could live and raise a family in that sound. So, and he's still there after 30 or some odd, odd years. So, yeah, it's a fun section. Uh, Josh says, tell, tell Andy the joke about what you would say to each other after concerts. Do you remember you and Josh had jokes oh. after concerts? Well, there's a couple of them. Uh oh. Uh, oh. Oh. They're all G-rated, right? This is a family show, right? Oh, it's just like somebody would say, if somebody was sitting next to you and then the guy further down, you, you would rave about the guy saying who's playing third class. That was fantastic. You were wonderful. And the guy sitting next to you would say, huh, yeah, see you tomorrow. You know, <laughs> just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, or I would say something like, you know, Josh, that was good. A little too good, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, and the New York freelancers would always, uh, I, when I was there, they say, "Wow, you sounded fantastic." How did I sound? <laughs> oh, I know, I know, I know. And um, also, we had. Let's see, we have. Hello, Andrew, and Michael watching from. God, everybody's watching. I have to. Talk. Yes. Oh, come on. <laughs> All right. So, don't you have anything more to ask me? I got a lot of stuff. Okay, I'll tell you the list. No, no, no. I got a lot. I got a lot of boring conductors. Okay, we want to hear the boring things. Oh, finish your conductor list. Finish your okay. conductor list after Stravinsky. Uh, let's see, William Steinberg. You know they never yeah. hire. They don't hire conductors unless they. I'm sorry, Andy. But what, I say to what? what? They don't hire conductors unless. It's like the presidents of the United States. You got to wear a wig or something. That's they, they have oh. to have a full of hairs. I, 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 like uh, William Steinberg was a great conductor, but nobody would hire him. He was in uh, Pittsburgh, I think, and then yeah. played under Eugene. By, by the, what I heard about him when uh, was I think Stanley Hasty was his first principal. It was his first clarinetist. Um, yeah. I, what I heard, I don't know if some of their students can can um, verify it. What, um, it all costs. He wanted a huge crescendo in the Beethoven says. If you want to slur it, go ahead, do whatever you want, but it's all about that huge crescendo down there. Um, and, and what's that? Yeah, I'm listening. 
Yeah, no, I don't know. So I, I think on a recording, uh, Ace got away with slurring it or something like that. I don't know. No, don't but know. here's a story with that. Zell was conducting the Beethoven Six, my father was playing. Staccato was not his forte. So Zell, he would go, da, la, da, 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 but then Zell kind of gave in. Yeah, that, I remember Zell. He kind of scared me a little bit. Oh. Anyway, so, and then we had Eugene Ormandy, and I did Rocky II with him. Wow. And, and it was good. I thought it was better than average. So I'm kind of picky. So I'd come up to him. Yeah, it's really great working with you. And he was like up to here. And he says, good playing, but too tall. So I, <laughs> <laughs> so I was wearing these shoes. And I said, they were, you know, with those thick, high shoes at the time. So I, I stepped down, but it was still about like this. And it just <laughs> stomped off. I mean, God, I'm only 5'4". I guess he was 4'9". Or something. <laughs> but he was a good conductor. Um, <laughs> who else is? Bernstein was good. Oh, who else did I play under? Giulini? Barbaroli? Did, Les, M- Michelle, did you, like, other than uh, Copeland, uh, I, I mean, some of these names you're talking about, did you play some concertos ever with them? Um, God, I'm getting so old, I can't remember, which means no. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, I played a lot of concerti with uh, the regular conductors. I did the Mozart way too many times. It should sound, it sounded better by the, I did, I rec- played solos maybe six, 70 concerti with the orchestra. Really Good. a lot of concerti, yeah. you know. And so, okay, Pierre Boulez. That guy was the man. We did the Wooden Prince. Have you ever done that? No. That great, great piece. He loved Bartok. Why Boulez? He, he's, Bartok was wild, and Boulez was such a straight ahead guy. You know, he liked everything cool and balanced. In fact, one time somebody was measuring his feet for some special tennis shoes, Boulez. And everybody has one foot a little larger, not Boulez. <laughs> the same size. <laughs> so he was like, cool. But I, I the, only, the greatest compliment in my life, and I have to just come. So, you know, usually I don't talk about myself in compliments, but I knew this was the last time Boulez was going to conduct an orchestra because he didn't, just didn't think it was good enough anymore. <laughs> so he said, he would tell Fleischman, our manager, nah, orchestra's not that good, so I'll just stick with Chicago. John Ye sticks in Boulez, awesome, speaking of Chicago. Yeah, oh, yeah. So I, I walked up to him and I, you know, he loved my playing for some reason. So I just said, hi, he says, Michelle, your music. That's the greatest compliment I ever got in my life. He just said, wow. I'm music. Wow. And that, oh, man. So I love Boulez. And I never had very good rhythm, but he, he knew how to conduct people that didn't have great rhythm. You know, he just would just lead us through miraculous Mandarin. I didn't know how to do that seven stuff and that nine stuff, but he would just, he could conduct anything. You know, two hands and different rhythms. And why would you think he's such a good conductor? It's just straight conducting, right? But the feeling he had underneath was so special. Wouldn't it's it's incredible. So I think Frankie recorded the uh, pr- the the premier rhapsody with Boulez. Yeah. Yep, that's right. A- and and he actually likes it. <laughs> wow. Frank- if Frank never likes anything, here. anything, yeah, that's <laughs> great. I heard that. That was so great. You know, there was a time when we all got together in Marlboro, Stoltzman, Frankie, me, and um, a couple of other clarinet players. It was just a funny time. The only other time when all the clarinet players were together was in 1967 or 68. We were all trying out for the Boston Symphony, so everybody was there. Larry Combs. I don't know, uh, uh, me, Lauren Levy. I mean, he was so, he was young that his feet were dangling from the chair. I mean, <laughs> everybody who was anybody was there. So it was a good in time we met. We all realized, well, we know who's going to get it. 
<laughs> buddy ride, and I'm good with that. You know, I walked on. I and I and the people behind. He, he probably had a good read. He probably had a good read. I know. You know but he <laughs> they said, "Oh, the girls playing plunk plunk." They could hear my high heels, so that they knew. So, <clears throat> yeah, it was, I had a great life. It's hard to give it up. I gotta be honest. <laughs> you don't have to give up your life, please. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, it was like, I'm so used to people, you know, you know, now they don't treat, you know, like they, they just treat me like a regular person. I, I'm so used to being, <laughs> I, I like, I like being the queen. I mean, I feel half of the people, they're like my, all my in-laws and relatives, they don't know about me. And they said, I feel like, say, don't you know who I am? You know, that kind of thing. It's hard. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Is that when you leave the orchestra, it's just not, it's going to be a little different. You know, you have to pretend like you're humble. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so that, but I'm, I'm, this is a, I feel so lucky. Oh my God. To meet you, to meet you all. This has been fantastic. Is the hour up? Because I have ADD. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we don't, we don't, we don't have time limits on this thing, but, but, it, but look, um, it's 136 in the morning. Yeah, it's one thirty six in the morning here. And Lorenzo's letting me know. Let's go to sleep. But, 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 um, when did we start? Well, I, we've, 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 we sort of, met, it, we've had a, an hour and a half. So why don't, oh, why don't we, yeah. we oh, just, just a very, just a very, just two or three very quick questions, right? Uh, a quick, just one that that I want to know about, especially as this guy's giving me a hard time, right? I mean, I understand you and your dad were playing practical jokes. I understand he get, he was a you know influential teacher, blah blah blah. But I'm curious. I mean, there are um, administrative things, especially when 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 you have the same job and this. I mean, were there ever arguments or fights? I mean, no, you want this week off. No, he want needs us to do something. No, 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 we didn't have that. We didn't have. Wow. That. We just got along. We just, it was amazing. And the way Lauren and I, you know, Lauren was sharing the position too. That's so true. I just, yeah. Yeah. I flipped a coin and then whoever won the, I won the coin. And then I just picked the repertoire for the first week, went every, every other week for the rest of our career there. So no, we did, we got along really well. Sometimes um, the politics were a little rough sometimes, but that's how, you know, because his politics were a little different than mine. But, you know, but I just like, like I'm not thrilled with Russia and he was very thrilled with Russia because at that time in 1938, everybody was thrilled with the propaganda that came from Russia. You know, Stalin was sending out all these notes. Hey, I'm groovy, man. You know, I, then I, but I read books. <laughs> hey, dad, I read a book about it. So, so we'd fight about the politics a little bit, and interesting. Yeah, it was it was fun. Um, and so one okay. So I mean, this is just it's been amazing. It's been amazing hearing all these things, and I think Jim's getting a, a, upset with us over there. No, he's not. He didn't get a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Will you hurry up? Send <laughs> your emails. You got the time off. I did get. I got a cute haircut. But it's not a haircut. I combed it. What happened? <laughs> Who's talking about haircuts? I thought you were getting a haircut. <laughs> he did say a haircut earlier I'm, on. You know, we've been together for three months now. You know Fuck it. I feel like killing her. Here we go again, Michelle. <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what, Michelle. We'll we'll let you. I, I, we'll let you get there. But just along the lines of of all this, um, just give one some pearls of advice to young people. So, I mean, you've had this amazing life, this amazing musical life, and everything else. And and if and if you just had to sum up. You know, what would you do again? What wouldn't you do again? What would you advise people in today's world uh, to do? Are, are there some tendencies you see maybe in young people that you wish they, they, they were less of or more of or anything like that? Make masks. <laughs> Make masks. No. Um, 
honestly, it's hard now. It's, it's hard to get a job. There's a million people. What do you want? Who? You. Who's him? That's it next to you. Oh, and Mark? We're talking Mark? about jobs and stuff. No, it's okay, hard to Jim, get Jim, Jim, just give us five minutes, man, okay? Take care. God, you see what I'm going through? Okay. And they, she'll, <laughs> she'll, 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 she'll stay there, all right? God, close the door. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I even hear Naldo laughing back there, you know, okay. <laughs> This, um, anyway, so what's the good advice? You guys want a job, right? Let's say. I gotta pick the right parents, you know. <laughs> no, no, I, no. I mean, that's a, that's a fair. That's you know. No, no. You have to. I don't know. I don't know now. It's so hard. It's terrible. It's it's just there are too many people. So you have to find. I think you have to find your way and try not to be influenced by so much information on, on the net, internet. It, uh, Hindemith said, that's the end of music when he found out about records. What happens is you hear all the music and then you put it, it becomes not you after a while. So you can't, don't get so influenced. Honestly, I think that's the reason I, I did well, because I didn't get influenced. The only thing that influenced me was the score. You start to listen from there, you get a little of this, a little, it's like too many cooks spoil the broth. That's, mm. that's number one. So you have to find what you feel. And you have to practice like a son of a gun. You really do, hours and hours. You have to find a setup that allows you to practice comfortably. You have to, don't, don't, don't say, oh my God, maybe I'm doing things wrong. Trust yourself. Trust the sound that you've been taught. Trust everything. Because otherwise, even if you don't win that audition, if you try to play, please everybody, you'll please nobody. Please yourself. And then do what is necessary. You have to project. You have to have good rhythm. You have to have, you have to feel it from within not how this guy feels it or that gal feels it. It has to come from within. That your own kernel of strength. That's that's what I would suggest. Honestly. Great. Wonderful advice. Uh, send my love to Jim because I, I, I want to tell you something. Lorenzo's keeping uh, tabs of the numbers and as soon as you got into your exchange... It spiked ten percent. Okay, so I mean, yeah. how do you think I feel? Okay, yeah. how, do think, how do you think I feel when we talk? It's in a lull, but when you talk with Jim, everyone thinks it's exciting. So you know, I, I it's for nothing. Well, Jimmy. Anyway, yeah. Where are you? <laughs> oh, I think he's he's a he's on the phone. He's the oh. next. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> Michelle, I can't thank you. Enough. And it's been so, I mean, the whole week or, or more that we've been exchanging. I mean, I, I feel like you're my shrink. I mean, we, we, we're doing five emails a day. We're talking about our I know, I love it. It's really fun. It's really fun. So it, we'll agree to not blackmail each other and, and we're good, I think. No, you're awesome. You're awesome. <laughs> thank you for, you know, other my, otherwise, I'm just, especially now, it's been kind of, dull a little and you just made my whole week really oh, yeah well. you're the best and then i got to hear you awesome oh, oh thanks so much it means so much it really does come free don't forget i was a little punk when i was going to your concerts in new york and didn't you play shepherd on the rock with kathleen battle in new york does that sound right I've done that yeah yeah yeah, I remember. I think Leon introduced me to you there. There, I, and I, I mean, it was yeah. I mean, okay, it was memorable. I met, obviously forty years later, or whatever. So, um, 
you know. Probably, probably, I'm like Frank. It probably sucked. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it did. You trust? You, you just said you trust my 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 uh, musicianship a little bit, so it didn't. Take my word for it. Um, anyway, anyway I, I, and now though, you get one last uh, bow. Come in front of the camera. No, you're, no, you're, no, you're, no. Your your contribution, seriously. I mean, your support for all these projects that I'm trying to do. It's just really fantastic the having you laugh at their exchange <laughs> just made my day so it, you, i mean thank you so much Ednaldo, and and for helping michelle and and michelle thank you for helping it oh, <laughs> always nice. have a good read <laughs> and yeah. uh and thanks so much and michelle i i, I hope we can stay stay in contact uh oh, very I shortly love, soon I love okay you. great okay. lorenzo it's almost two in the morning. Bye -bye. What? <laughs> he keeps yeah. us saying it's two in the morning. He needs yeah, to get back. My pajamas, yeah. Sure. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, we're gonna have. Well, just thank you so much. Okay, Michelle, all the best. Wash your hands. Stay safe. Okay, everybody.